Hello, everyone. My name is Janice Stoll. I'm the medical director of the pediatric liver transplant program here at St. Louis Children's Hospital. And um, I will be talking to you today on the topic of Fontan associated liver disease in children, adolescents, and young adults. Just for a broad overview of what we'll be talking about today, I'm going to go through with you the Fontan physiology and how the heart affects the liver over time and why it affects the liver over time. I'm going to be talking about the most common questions that I get asked in clinic about liver disease and the progression of liver disease. I'm going to speak a little bit about what, when you should start seeing your liver doctor approximately and what to think about when you do see your liver doctor to what to ask them, and also some just broad tips on keeping your liver healthy over time. So to um, start us off, I wanted to speak a little bit about the function and overall anatomy of the liver, and this will give you some background as to why Fontan physiology does affect the liver over time. So in general terms, the function of the liver is that there is, it, the liver produces bile and proteins. The bile that it produces then gets excreted and gets stored sometimes in the gallbladder and also gets into the small intestine to help you absorb your food, your nutrients, your vitamins. It also produces proteins like albumin and other proteins that help to move cholesterol through the body. It filters substances and toxins like ammonia. And then it also regulates clotting factors and helps to clear medications over time as well. Um, there are some other functions as well, but those are some of the main ones. And on the left side of your screen, you can see the normal vascular anatomy of the liver. So in general, you're, there are two blood supplies to the liver, the portal vein and the hepatic artery, which is in red right here. Two thirds of the blood flow to the liver come from the portal vein, which is a, a much lower flow than the hepatic artery, which is coming directly from the aorta and supplies fresh blood that's coming from the heart. Inside the liver, things are a very low flow and the blood that you see comes in from the hepatic artery and portal vein gets all filtered into this area called the sinusoids where it feeds the liver cells called the hepatocytes. And then that filtered blood that gets filtered through the hepatocytes exits the liver through the hepatic vein, which is up top on the liver right here. So the hepatic vein is the main source of outflow for the liver and that goes directly to the heart. And so when the heart has increased pressure for any reason, then that flow actually reverses and causes increased backflow of blood into the hepatic vein and causes congestion of the liver, which is one of the a term I'll, I'll use commonly through this. And that congestion over time will make this portal vein also have sluggish flow or backflow of pressure, which will then feed back into some of these other vessels here called your splenic vein and your coronary vein. And this is what leads to some complications that we would see over time with liver disease. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about the Fontan anatomy and how it impacts the liver. So there are two main things that happens in Fontan physiology. One is that there's an increased central venous pressure. And what I talked about that's the, that the hepatic veins see increased pressure, that's what I'm talking about. That backflow from having an elevated side, that side of the heart pressure, it causes um, something called hepatic afterload, which just means that those vessels that are leading from the liver have a higher pressure. And so it's harder to get blood flow going forward and it acts up backing up into the liver causing passive venous congestion. And over time, that you can actually see the impact of that because the inside the liver, there's scar tissue that develops over time and eventually will lead to enough scar tissue to be called cirrhosis. There's also decreased cardiac output and that causes the, some lower systemic vascular resistance. And because of that, the hepatic artery that I showed you that provides some blood flow to the liver as well, will not be providing the same amount of blood flow that you would typically see. And because of that, there's remodeling inside the liver, which can cause nodules over time to develop, which can then become cancerous and also can impact with the low blood, lower blood flow to the liver, um, some um, damage called ischemia. So this can cause chronic liver hypoperfusion and over time it results in something called portal hypertension. So when you injure liver cells, what happens is, is that these other cleanup cells that kind of come in to fix the liver cells will then 
produce something called scar tissue and fi fibrous tissue over time. And that active formation of fibrous tissue is what's developing over years and years and years in Fontan patient population. And over time, if you get enough scar tissue, you can be called cirrhosis or end stage liver disease um, and have a very nodular liver. Now, this isn't like a linear process where we know exactly how much scar tissue is forming year after year. It takes many, many years. And, and actually, scar tissue forms different for every patient within a certain population of patients with a certain liver disease. So with the Fontan patient population, it will uh, oftentimes the liver damage starts occurring very young, but you don't actually see the results of that until 10, 20, sometimes even 25 years after um, the Fontan procedure is complete. But the problem is, is that when you get to this nodular, cirrhotic, end-stage liver disease, you can get a couple of things that we worry about in the liver world. One of them is something called portal hypertension. So when that backflow of the hepatic, uh, hepatic vein leads to increased pressures of the liver, and then that leads to the portal vein having backflow, you can end up having things like a very large spleen. And because of all the extra pressure in those vessels, you can develop other vessels that come throughout your GI tract, some in your esophagus, some in your small intestine, some in your um, your rectum, and these are varices that can bleed over time. You can also develop increased fluid on the belly, as well as sometimes, uh, which is called ascites. You can become a bit confused, something called encephalopathy, when you don't get the, the appropriate toxins filtered out of your bloodstream. And it also will increase your bleeding risk over time too, because you're lacking some of the clotting factors that are, are needed. Um, I did mention to you that we do sometimes see nodules form within patients with Fontan uh, physiology. These nodules are oftentimes benign, and it's because of the altered blood flow to the liver, but sometimes they can actually be more malignant and, and develop into hepatocellular carcinoma, something we screen for very closely. That is a treatable cancer, which you can either take part of the liver out and resect, you can give therapies for that, but oftentimes these patients do need liver transplant if a hepatocellular carcinoma is found. And then also patients can develop liver failure, which is very rare in the Fontan patient population, but can happen if you have a very damaged liver and undergo a big procedure without treatment for that liver. So the typical trajectory of liver disease in Fontan physiology is that you develop this liver congestion, this altered blood flow, and over time, fibrosis will develop without portal tension, hypertension. And you wouldn't even know that that fibrosis is developing, except for some very subtle findings on labs and maybe imaging and physical exam. And then lastly, you develop this advanced fibrosis with portal hypertension. And then you'll have some pretty clear signs with labs, imaging, and on physical exam as well when you go see your physician. Um, and this is all the risk factors that are related to this we spoke a bit about but there's also some subtleties that I'm not going to go into today that talk about um, uh, you know, some arrhythmias that can affect the liver and some uh, ventricular dysfunction. And then this other category, which you see down here at the bottom of the table too, um, on the slide, means that there are patients who are born with other liver diseases that can also impact the liver. And when you have the combination of Fontan physiology and a secondary liver disease, those patients are actually at higher risk for developing advanced liver disease in the future. So we do screen for some of those diseases um, over time if we're worried about how quickly liver disease is coming, uh, coming on. So I think this is a good picture that kind of shows you that typically less than 10 years after Fontan operation, we don't see too much in the way of advanced fibrosis or significant portal hypertension or complications from advanced fibrosis with liver disease. Sometimes we do, and, some, and then we do screen those patients for secondary liver diseases that may be impacting it as well, but oftentimes we do not. And if you're less than 10 years after a Fontan operation, most often you're asymptomatic. Very rarely people describe a um, kind of a right upper quadrant abdominal discomfort or heaviness, and that's just from the liver being a bit engorged or congested. And then in labs, sometimes we'll see a mildly elevated bilirubin level, something called the GGT being mildly elevated as well. And if we were to biopsy the liver, which we oftentimes do not in that younger age group, we would see the liver look congested, where we see what I've described dilation in between the liver cells. 
So it just looks a little bit boggy or edematous in a way. 10 to 15 years after Fontan um, operation, we start seeing more scar tissue develop typically. Again, you wouldn't see this in your clinical um, history. People wouldn't describe too much to you. Maybe you'll have a little bit of a congestion feeling again, but we're gonna start potentially seeing those liver numbers become a little bit more abnormal. The liver numbers being your AST, ALT, and GGT start to rise a bit. And if we were to biopsy the liver, we'll see more scar tissue developing. And the scar tissue looks more like a lacy scar tissue where those dilations I just spoke of, you'll see more scar tissue coming in where those spaces are. And then usually after 15 years after the Fontan operation, we're seeing symptoms developing from portal hypertension, maybe fluid on the belly, sometimes bleeding. Um, sometimes you can be a bit confused or have some, some memory loss. And then the labs do be, start becoming more abnormal, a lower protein level. Sometimes the clotting factors can be at, off. And if we did do the biopsy again, we'll see much more scar tissue. Sometimes even we'll be describing it as cirrhosis. And also we can see those nodules forming and are looking very intently for that hepatocellular carcinoma. So how this is typically monitored? Well, as a hepatologist, I typically don't see every single person who has had a Fontan operation until they're, again, about eight to 10 years out of the Fontan operation, or if there's any concerns that your cardiologist is seeing. They're, the, cardiologist, the, the cardiology team is typically doing labs every one or two years, looking at liver numbers, looking at clotting factors, how the kidneys are functioning, how the blood count is doing, if there's concerns at all that, that, that they are, um, that they're, that is being raised and they will contact us to discuss those labs and see if it benefits to see them, uh, see these patients in liver clinic. Um, if there are concerns with the liver numbers being off in some way, we would typically start with an ultrasound of the liver spleen, the vessels that are leading to the liver. This is already usually been done when um, we the, when there's a baby with congenital heart disease. So we usually have a baseline image of the belly as well to make sure that there's no abnormal vessels leading to or from the liver and that, that wouldn't impact things over time. But once something becomes out of the range of normal, we typically do start seeing folks in liver clinic, usually yearly, where we start doing our clinical exam, talking about how we're gonna follow things along. Is the spleen becoming big? Are there any clinical symptoms that are developing? Every year, once you see us in liver clinic, we tend to start calculating scores. Um, these scores are called the PELS and the MELD scores, pediatric end-stage liver disease or model for end-stage liver disease. These are scores that are based upon a couple of lab values that we're seeing over time and making sure that things aren't getting bad enough in the liver that we need to start thinking about, does that liver or heart need to be replaced at some point? We also discuss other imaging modalities such as MRI, CT scan, um, and we talk about if a, cat, a cardiac cath is done, should we be doing other invasive procedures, measuring liver pressures, or doing liver biopsies? So first things first, we typically, our first screening exam by far and away is the ultrasound. Um, we take a look at the liver itself and make sure that, that um, kids and babies aren't born with any abnormalities of their bile ducts or vessels of the liver itself, if there's any cysts or nodules. So we're looking at the liver parenchyma and, and if anything is going um, amiss there. But now we actually are able to see a couple of uh, fancier details. So if you look here on the right of your screen, you can see that I have a couple of colored pictures here with some waves on them. Um, the picture on the top is a, a, an infant with um, a Fontan uh, and had um, not had many years um, after the procedure. And so you can see these waves on the right, they're kind of close together, meaning that the waves go quickly through the liver and aren't slowed down by anything. And that's actually a nice picture of a pretty normal liver right there. On the bottom, this is years later of the same patient. Um, the color of the, the liver looks a different on the left side. You can see it's a little bit more turquoise. There's a little bit more fat in the liver. And then on the right side, the waves are further apart. And that's actually just showing us the stiffness is increasing over time. And so we're able to say with a lot of the ultrasounds that we do these days is the stiffness 
normal? Is it abnormal? Um, is it increasing over time? And we oftentimes do this on a serial basis, meaning yearly or every other year to see what those scores are doing over time. We can also take a look at the vessels and make sure the flow is going in the right direction, not in the wrong direction, coming back from the liver. And if there's any concerns for that, we typically go on to the next imaging modality, which is most often MRI. We use MRI, um, uh, we can see a lot more on MRI than we can see on CT scan imaging. Um, however, sometimes with uh, pacemakers and things that are not MRI compatible, we do end up doing CT imaging as well. The MRI imaging is, um, is, is quite detailed. So you can see on the left side of the screen, that's the liver. It's a cross-sectional image of the liver. So you're looking at it as if we're slicing a body kind of midway this way and not up and down, but um, through the body. And the arrows that are pointing out, the white arrow, you can actually see that the outside of the liver looks bumpy. So there are some nodules that are forming. It looks like a nodular liver. Usually it's very smooth um, on the top there. And there it's just a bit bumpy. And so that's telling us that there's more advanced liver disease in this liver. And then we can also see the bile ducts, the vessels, and also how big the spleen is getting as well, as well as is there any other things like varices that are forming over time. On the right side of the screen, this is another different technique that we're using these days called MR elastography where we can actually see how much scar tissue or stiffness the liver has over time. Now on the top part of the screen, what we wanna see in the liver is this nice blue, purple, little bits of green here and there. But when it starts becoming yellow and red and orange, like the bottom part of the screen, that's when we know that the stiffness is increasing over time. So again, this is the same patient over a number of years where you can see where the top part, that's a, a relatively normal appearing liver, and then things are just becoming more stiff and more firm over time. We're also using MRIs when we start screening for any sign of liver nodules or liver lesions. And like I said, these, these do have the potential for developing over time. And we typically screen every year to every other year, either using ultrasounds or MRI or CT technology to look for these lesions. On the left side of your screen, you can see these arrows that are pointing out those liver lesions um, that are, are present in a patient with Fontan associated liver disease. And then we have a screening algorithm. So we, our radiologists can tell if this is a concerning nodule or not. And if it is concerning, how often we need to screen that going forward. Oftentimes it's between anywhere between three, six and three and six months or up to one year for screening. And we also have a lab test that we're following as well. Typically every six months um, for the labs, if we're starting to see any nodules in the liver. If we have concerns for what this looks like and we can't tell by imaging alone, we can use CT guided imaging um, to biopsy that lesion as well. So liver biopsies, although they are our gold standard for knowing what's going on in the liver, we don't often do that for our patients with Fontan associated liver disease unless we have a clinical concern for, is this a nodule we should be worrying about? Or is there, um, uh, is there enough scar tissue that we should be worried about how this liver will fare over time if the, the patient needs to undergo a big surgery or a heart transplant? And I say it's the gold standard, but we're, when you take a liver biopsy, it's a very small look into the liver. It's one fifty thousandth of the liver when you're doing a liver biopsy. And so there could be some sampling error, meaning that if you biopsy in one area of the liver, it may not look like another area of the liver Although we, we tend to think that it, it should look like the remainder of the liver, it doesn't exactly mean that it would. And there's still a risk for bleeding and other complications of a biopsy. So we want to make sure we're choosing the right patient population to undergo a liver biopsy. But when I described to you earlier about what the liver looks like in a patient with Fontan associated liver disease, in the A portion of the slide, you can see how those white spaces um, are present. Now, in a typical patient without Fontan liver disease, we shouldn't see any spaces at all. You would be filled in by these little blue circle cells that you see there, and it would be a nice a sheet the entire way across. When you have Fontan associated liver disease, those spaces start developing because that's the congestion that's coming in. And over time, you can see on the B section, that blue that uh, beautiful blue area that's coming in, that's the scar tissue that's starting to fill in all of those sinusoids, those congested areas, and it will start bridging between other areas of the liver. And over time, that's what happens and becomes 
a cirrhotic nodular liver that causes end-stage liver disease. We also, like I mentioned before, use the liver biopsy to rule out any other liver diseases that could be occurring in our patient population. We also are able, during a cardiac cath that our patients often do get on a regular basis, to measure the pressures of those vessels that are leading from the liver to the heart. And by doing that, by placing a small catheter and blowing up a little balloon and getting the pressure measurement, we're able to say, is the major issue coming from the heart, from the increased pressure of the heart, or is the liver itself damaged enough that the liver itself is at risk for um, further decline and causing problems for our patients that have Fontana-associated liver disease? And so oftentimes, the cardiac catheter, um, cath physicians are able to get us some really good measurements that help us to predict, will the liver do well with a big surgery or a transplant, or will that liver not fare well and need to be replaced? So when I see patients in clinic, which is typically yearly, sometimes every six months, very rarely more frequently than that, I talk about preventative care for the liver because preventative care is the key to success. If we're able to, to find out the subtleties of how the liver is doing over time and how it may fare in the next three, six, 12 months, or even years later, I can start having conversations about um, uh, what are the possibilities that could happen with the liver and at what point we need to think that the liver needs to be replaced or are there any big concerns that we should be watching out for. So prevention is key, preventative care is key, and knowing um, uh, and, and getting all the appropriate screening down um, and on a timely fashion is also key. We'll talk about any symptoms that you're having in clinic. We would talk about any episodes of jaundice or yellowing of the eyes or skin, easy bruising, bleeding, um, any increased fatigue. A lot of the questions that your cardiologist will also ask you as well um, but we're also going to be making sure that you've gotten your immunizations up to date for all the liver-specific things that we'd be watching out for and talking about liver health. Um, usually labs are being done once you're seeing a hepatologist every six months and usually lim imaging via ultrasound, MRI, or CT yearly. And then we talk about things where, you know, is the heart, how far along is the heart disease and is that how is that related to the liver disease that's going on? If the heart disease is doing really well and the liver disease is suffering, then we really do need to say, is there anything else going on in the liver that we need to address? Is there a secondary liver disease that could be going on? Um, and then we also talk to the cardiologist on a very regular basis because that communication is key, again, to making sure that all lines of communication are open in case we feel the liver is doing worse and we want to make sure that that is related to your cardiologist, um, if there's any concern for that. Once our patient population with Fontan liver disease has known cirrhosis and portal hypertension, then we are really attentive to the, the following things. We are making sure all the screenings for hepatocellular carcinoma are done in a timely fashion. That means that lab that I discussed before called the AFP and typically MRI or CT imaging if we can't get an MRI. We start screening for things like varices, and that means we take a, a um, endoscope under sedation and look down in our patient's esophagus, stomach, and small intestine and make sure that there is no big vessels that are at risk of bleeding. We also look for any fluid accumulation on the belly and help to manage that. And we talk about um, any memory changes, sleep disturbances that could be subtle findings of hepatic encephalopathy. And then, like I mentioned, this is all in very close communication, either in Fontan Clinic or when I see patients elsewhere in my own liver clinic about how the liver is faring and over time and if we have concerns about that liver either having failure or getting worse to the point where I would say um, is it either a heart transplant or a liver transplant um, or a combination warranted. So, you know, this, that ends up with a very uh, um, close monitoring um, at that time and discussion with our heart transplant and heart failure colleagues about um, if the heart ever needs to be replaced after the um, disease has progressed and heart failure has progressed to a certain point and how the liver is faring at that point. Now, typically all of our Fontan patients 
who are undergoing heart transplant evaluation will be seen by a liver doctor, either in isolation, the liver team, or the whole liver transplant team for a liver transplant evaluation. Because what we're trying to decide is how the liver will fare during heart transplant. If a heart transplant is needed, will the liver be okay? Will it recover? Is, or is it damaged enough where we're concerned that the liver is going to fail after heart transplant alone, in which case we would recommend a combined heart and liver transplant. There has been many studies to, to say um, which is better, either heart transplant alone or would a combined actually be improved um, for your immune system to recover after transplant and the other uh, and, and for healing purposes as well. What we really would like is for all of the scar tissue to regress after transplant, but we heart transplant alone, but we know that that isn't going to happen. There is some, some um, improvement of the fibrosis, but it's typically not 100%. And no matter what, if, you, if a patient went for heart transplant alone, they would still need to be followed by a liver doctor, usually yearly, to ensure that all the screenings are still kept up with to make sure that liver isn't gonna suffer over time. Because even though we know that there's some healing, it typically isn't 100% healing of the liver. And we still need to monitor for some of the liver specific findings like hepatocellular carcinoma over time. But these are the conversations that are happening uh, behind the scenes and with you in clinic about how will that liver do over time. And you know, we are thinking long and hard um, still involved with many studies to say, when is liver transplant needed? Um, like I mentioned, everybody who has cirrhosis and portal hypertension will have a hepatology consult in consideration of liver transplant um, and oftentimes be seen by the entire liver transplant uh, team. We do know that if there's any liver lesions that are concerning for hepatocellular carcinoma or developing hepatocellular carcinoma, those patients often do need a combined heart liver transplant. If there's ever been liver decompensation in the past, that means if, you, if a patient's ever had a GI bleed, um, an episode of encephalopathy, um, massive ascites or fluid on the belly that's developed, then those patients often need a combined transplant as well. And that hepatic venous pressure gradient that I mentioned, if that's very high, indicating the liver has a primary issue going on that it's not related to the heart, then those patients oftentimes need a liver transplant as well. We are also calculating scores. Um, those scores that I mentioned called the model for end-stage liver disease, a pediatric end-stage liver disease score. These scores are made up of lab values that we are commonly getting, your clotting factors, your bilirubin, your, how your kidneys are functioning. But that MELD score does take into account that coagulation number, and oftentimes our patient population is actually on Coumadin or Warfarin, and that will skew the results of that score. So we also have a score dedicated to patients who, like our Fontan patient population, who are often on Coumadin, which excludes that clotting factor. And we know that about 15 to 16 is the cutoff. If your score is higher than that, that means that the liver likely would need to be replaced at the time that the heart is replaced. But it's not 100% predictive of outcome. If the score is less than 15 or 16, those patients often would be able to recover from heart transplant alone. But that, again, is not 100% predictive. And we're using all the different factors involved when we're looking at those, um, those scores. And just briefly, I wanted to mention that, you know, these, this is a, a patient population from Atlanta where they looked at pre- heart transplant alone and post-heart transplant alone and looked at their numbers, especially their liver numbers, their MRI scores, their MELD scores, their pressures. And you can see with all of the different graphs that after their heart transplant alone, all of the numbers got better. Their pressures got better, their liver scores got better, their MRIs got better. And um, as long as you were under that score of 16, those MELD scores got better as well. And so we do know that the majority of patients can get better after isolated heart transplant, but it's our job to make sure to, to, to know if that um, a, a liver transplant is needed. So do put your faith and trust in the hepatology team. We meet together as a multi-specialty transplant team for the transplant evaluations. There's a cardiac transplant team, there's a liver transplant team, and then we all come together and talk. 
and the ultimate decision is made as a team. We work on contingency and follow-up plans, how, how closely we need to follow up every six months, every 12 months. We have intensive meetings about surgical planning, and we do post-operative combined care for optimized outcomes in the ICU and beyond. Lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about optimizing liver health. So, uh, you know, when you talk to your liver doctor, we'll talk about things that are important that we know that are new in the literature about diet and exercise. Some of the thing, key points that I wanted to bring up with you is making sure that everyone is immunized for hepatitis A and B. Those are the one vaccines that we can get to protect your liver so you have no secondary liver diseases that may come in and impact a patient who already has a risk for liver disease. We also make sure that you're immune to hepatitis A and B with labs. We ask to avoid hepatotoxic medications. Sometimes it's unavoidable in the ICU and the hospitalizations, but if at all possible, we run through the list of medicines. And if you have any concerns, you can call us about that. Avoid and limit alcohol, which we know would be toxic to the liver, especially if you have a secondary liver disease. We uh, you know, talk about optimizing the heart physiology as much as possible with whatever, the, whatever procedures the cardiologist can do. And then most really very importantly is trying to keep an ideal weight and avoid a secondary liver complication with fatty liver disease or steatohepatitis. You know, um, the ideal diet for the liver is a Mediterranean diet, get keeping good exercise and activity and getting adequate sleep is actually really good for your liver. So lastly, you know, we, we talk about how we screen all of our children, adolescents and adults, and we have these algorithms that we use. And this is what I went through this entire time and, um, and you know, know that we're always here to answer any questions about liver health. And, and that's what your hepatologist is for. Thank you very much. If you have any questions or anything you want to discuss, please feel free to email me and um, I hope you guys have a great day.